the great thing about cigars is that it doesn't care about your gender. It doesn't care about your political affiliation. Doesn't care about your age. Doesn't care about your background. Doesn't care about your race. Doesn't care about your socioeconomic economic status. You know, one of the great things about cigars is that it gets propagated throughout the cigar community is that this is the great equalizer. You can be the guy who owns the company or the guy who sweeps the floors. For that hour that you're smoking a cigar, you're on a level playing field. So listen to the play by play, day by day. What to do, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to the Day by Day podcast for your Day by Day broadcast. I'm your host, Day with an I, not a Y, do not ask why, and today we have a great one for y'all. If you're watching on YouTube, you can tell it's slightly different with the setting. That's because we are recording live from the VIP lounge of a cigar lounge, and the reason why is because, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by Damon Robinson of Charlotte Cigar Week. Brother Damon, what's going on, man? What's going on, good brother? Appreciate you having me, man. <laughs> I appreciate you for reaching out. I appreciate you for, you know, getting us in the VIP lounge. And we, you know, we, we, we ready to do it. Well, first of all, shout out to the guy, Preston. Uh, Preston Gray, who's the owner of uh, Taylor Smoke. He was gracious enough to allow us to use this space, you know, for a couple of hours. So shout out to you, Preston. We appreciate Preston. you, good brother. Yeah, seriously. And shout out to his staff for getting us all taken care of yeah man. yeah very very nice people help you know very um you know supportive and help with setting up you know help you bringing everything in and set up and whatnot um yeah so i i off bucks before even getting to down to the needy gritty of cigar and whatnot i totally recommend this spot 10 out of 10 so Your first far. first time so i've been in a cigar shop on my like 21st or 22nd birthday mm -hmm. and smoked a cigar and that was it okay did you I, smoke the whole cigar no oh, okay so I want to start there. Um, what is it? You're, you're a cigar enthusiast. Yeah. What yeah. is it about the cigar vibe? Because I, I see it a lot. You know, I see that it's not just about the cigar. I think it's like the whole aesthetic around it and whatnot. Right. So what is it about the cigar vibe, the cigar culture that, you know, has such an interest of you in? Well, so I. I guess the best way we put it is like kind of started at my genesis. Okay. So I've been smoking cigars now, I think about 16 consecutive years. I started, you know, back when I lived in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I shouldn't even give it that much credit saying I started in, you know, 16 years ago. Actually, one of my homegirls uh -huh. who was, uh, you know, uh, an, an alum of Tennessee State University, she got me to try my first cigar. Mm -hmm. You know, we was, uh, we kind of at this lounge, like after TSU homecoming, like this Sunday's football Sunday, right? So we all in, in this lounge, this bar, whatever, drinking, eating, watching games. And then on the other side is uh, the bar area to have pool tables. Okay. And you can smoke on the pool table side. So she and I love shooting pool. So she over there, you know, shooting or whatever. And, and while I'm shooting, she pulls out a cigar, cut it, light it, right? And she, was, and she started smoking. She was like, have you ever had a cigar before? I was like, nah. She's like, here, try this. It was a Romeo Julieta, 1875. Not that you would know that, just like more so for yeah, yeah, other yeah. folks, right? They would know. You know. Yeah. yeah. But she gave it to me, and first thing she said was, don't inhale, right? Now, up to that point, you know, I'd smoked other things. I'd, I'd smoked weed. Yeah. I'd smoked hookah. Yeah. I'd smoked beaties. I had a couple of black and miles, even had like one cigarette just to, out of curiosity. Yeah, right? I think everyone has at least tried one right, cigarette. Right, right. So, you know, I took a couple of puffs out of it, didn't really see the big deal, mm -hmm. gave it back to her, right? Yeah. But that was my first introduction. Okay. But, you know, later on that year, one of my homeboys who I, you know, worked with or whatever, he's an older guy, he used to smoke cigars all the time. Okay. Right? He smoked cigars at work in the back door. He's the one who helped cultivate you know, my love for cigars or whatever. So to ask me, like, you know, what is it about it? For me, it's the, it's, the, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a tobacco and a cigar nerd, man. It's like, I love everything cigars. You know what I mean? It's and, a lot but, to know about. Yeah, like, yeah. Even but the you know, dude, he was like, do you know, like, what do you want? I was like, well, this is my first time really uh -huh. stepping into that world, so I don't know. But he was like breaking down everything and whatnot. It's a lot to it. And, and cigar enthusiasts know the different you know, types of cigars, what it comes from, you know, what, so all of that. So, like, it's, it's a lot to know about it. Well, yeah, but I'm going to tell you right now, like, I wouldn't, not even just in this moment, just like if we were just not doing this, if we were just sitting in the lounge, just chopping up when you just yeah. met, I wouldn't be trying to inundate you with a bunch of cigar stuff, trying mm -hmm. to, you know, regale you with all this cigar knowledge. I would just be trying to figure out 
what it is that you like to eat, what you like to drink, and I would suggest a cigar based on that. Right? Really? So all yeah. of that goes into oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For choosing sure. a cigar. For sure. Okay, so let's try it out. Um, so me personally, I love spicy food. Okay. I love different, I love trying different ethnicities when it comes to food. Right. So I like different, you know, uh, exquisite cuisine, cuisines. So I like spicy food. Okay. Um, I like dark liquor. I spicy like food, cognac. dark liquor. Yeah. So, all right, cognac specifically? If I had to choose, yeah. Okay, if you had to choose cognac. Mm -hmm. All right, so cognac, spicy food. Mm -hmm. So something a little bit sweet, spicy, and, and, and peppery. Okay. Right? Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. So for you, I would definitely suggest something uh, Nicaraguan or Honduran. Right? Why so? Well, see, okay, so, and this is just a generalization, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you look at the different countries where tobacco is grown, you look at Dominican Republic, you look at Cuba, you look at Honduras, you look at Nicaragua, you look at Mexico, and then you can even come here, United States, to you know Connecticut and Pennsylvania, right. right? When you think about spicy tobacco, you typically start thinking about anywhere in Nicaragua. Okay. Right. Now there are different regions in Nicaragua where stuff is grown, so it tastes different, right, or whatnot. But generally speaking, you start thinking about spicy tobacco. You think about Nicaragua, right? You think about something that's more smooth, the more aromatic, a little sweeter. Not on, and I mean just like naturally sweet. You know, I tend to think about Dominican Republic. Okay. Right? And then when I think about mixing those two together, mm -hmm. I kind of think about Honduras. Mm. You know what I mean? So what is it about uh, Cuban cigars that makes it so prestigious? Well, you know what? That's a good question because they're not, mm. not anymore. Okay. You know, uh, I look at Cuban cigars the way I look at white women in the sixties. You wanted them because you couldn't have them. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no slight to any you know, of my white sisters out there. I'm just saying, just from a, from a black man's no, perspective I get it. and I get historical it. Yeah. looking, com that's why I always compare Cuban cigars uh, to now okay. is because, you know, back in the 60s or whatever, it was taboo for black men and white women to be together. You know, yeah. and some guys, you know, you always want what you can't have or you ain't supposed the, the, we to We do have. like the thrill of right. things. So, and that's the kind of thing, in, with, you know, with Cuban cigars in general. Okay. I'm not saying the Cuban cigars aren't good because there are certain yeah. Cuban cigars I love, yeah. right? But anybody in the cigar industry, anybody in the cigar community like mm -hmm. I am, right? Who's just smoked a plethora of different cigars from different places. They'll tell you this, that the best quality cigars are not made in Cuba. They're made in all those places I just told you about. Nicaragua, Dominican Republic. They're made in all those other places. Mm -hmm. Now, cigars, of course, they had their genesis yeah. in Cuba, right? But the best cigars are not made in Cuba. They're made in those other places nice. because of the quality control and, and, and the standards yeah. are a lot better because mm -hmm. in Cuba, the government controls cigars. Okay. In all other places, the government does not. So why was it that Cuban cigars, are they still like illegal? Well, so far as United States, they can't be sold in the United States. Now, okay. if you go to Cuba, you're allowed to bring back bring so back. many cigars okay. or whatnot. All right. Uh, why is that? Do you know why you... Because of the embargo. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's because gotcha. of the embargo. Gotcha. All right, well, let's do this. Um, let's actually get into these cigars. So this okay. would be my first time. So we have one fresh in the package. So like, how does the whole unraveling, you know what I'm saying, examining one and then the cutting of the cigar, like how does that work? Okay, so let me tell you what you have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these two are the same cigar, same company, just uh, the blend is slightly different and the wrapper is different. Okay. So it's called a Sir Robert Peel. This is by Protocol Cigars, right? This little clear thing right here is called cellophane. It's not plastic. It looks plastic, but it's not. Okay. It's actually made of cellulose because if you looked at it on the microscope, uh -huh. you could see the microscopic little holes in it that allow it to breathe like a sponge. Oh, right? okay. So it's not plastic. It's cellulose. Yeah, I definitely would have thought it was plastic. Yeah. So, um, so you take that out, and then these cigars actually have a foot band. A what now? A foot band. Okay. So you just slide the foot band off. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you the easy way to do it. Just uh -huh. go at, go at the head and uh -huh. then just squeeze it down. Like this? Yep, and just push it down. Ah. ah. That's a very educational episode, as yeah, you can take see. take that out, and then uh, just pull the foot band off. Pull the foot band off, which right. is at the top. Right, so cool. I have brought my, uh, this is the cutter I, I pretty much use, unless I'm using my teeth, which I use my teeth half the time. Um, this is what you call a straight cutter or a mm -hmm. guillotine cutter, Okay. Right? So all you're gonna do 
is would you like to do it or would you like me to do it? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to do it. Okay, where, perfect. How do you, I'm glad you yeah. said that. <laughs> yes. so, so where do you like, as far as cutting it, like where do you cut? How do you so, determine where so to this, cut? Great question. So what you do is before you do anything, you look at the scar. Uh -huh. This is, so the anatomy of the cigar is like, this is the, the whole cigar. Right. This is the barrel. Okay. This is the foot. Mm -hmm. This is the head. All right. This is the cap. Okay. You want to cut the cap off. Okay. Like literally like you're taking your cap off yeah. the head. Yeah. Same thing. Okay. There is a line. If you start at the top and look I down, the first line that you see, yep. that's the cap. Okay. So you're going to put the, the guillotine right over there. As mm -hmm. soon as you see the cap poking through, mm -hmm. You just snip it off. Let's see what you got. Well, you know what? That's uh, that's way too much. But for your first time doing it, not bad. It ain't, it, <laughs> it ain't great, but it ain't bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let me see there you it go. real quick. So, um, so. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I see. Damn. Yeah, I definitely took out too much. So what happens? So since I took a little bit too much off, like what would I like get more? Well, so the one of the things about using a, a guillotine cutter is that you can vary the the opening. Mm -hmm. So right now your cigar is is full it's open. open. Yeah, she's right? open. So and because I've had this cigar quite a few times, I already mm -hmm. know what the draw is like. Right. Um, and in in it's it's not roll too loose uh -huh. and it's not rolled too tight it's gotcha. actually kind of perfect gotcha. right but since you've got it full open mm -hmm. you're not going to puff on your cigar probably as much as i would because gotcha. my my open is right. isn't as big as yours is gotcha. right there, you know what i mean uh -huh. so uh the the general rule of thumb is like a couple of puffs a minute okay and uh you know some people in the cigar community they hate rules mm. right I don't like to use. I don't like to say rules as much as I like to say best practices, right? Uh, you can you, you buy your cigar, you can enjoy your cigar however the hell you want. You pay for it, right? But if you want to enjoy it better, there are certain best practices. Mm. And some people they hot box their cigar. They're like, you know, they three, four, five puffs uh -huh. every minute, and it got and it keeps on having this cherry uh, at the end of it, yeah. and that just it ruins the experience. Gotcha. So there's a couple of different ways you can light a cigar. My, preferred method especially when you know air conditions permit is by using a wooden match a wooden match gives you a soft flame and that's what you want and the thing is hold on a second good yeah this would be good for me to see how to actually light it all right so you round it all right cool so you nice how it's red on the end uh-huh that's what you want that, that lets you know that all the tobacco is yeah red, right so, so I, I um the way to do it is with a torch. Okay, yes, yeah, so I've so, seen the torch. So you can just take this, mm -hmm. and then what you do in your case. So the science of flame dictates that. Keep speaking to the mic. The, uh, the the science of flame dictates that the the blue uh -huh. is the hottest part of the fire. Right. So it's actually hot, right here. Right. So you don't need to put the blue in the cigar. You can just back it up. Okay. You see what I mean? Damn. Because what you want to do is you want to roast and toast, not scorch and torch. Mm. So we're going to roast and toast, not scorch and toast. Yeah. So just aim it, aim it at the foot. Don't put the blue in it. Gotcha. Just aim it at the foot and then, and you'll do it at an angle and then just roll it around until you see the entire foot is red. And then you give it a little blow to make the, the make sure the embers are burning on their own. Let me see what you got. Light it up a little bit more because your your edges are good, but your your filler isn't. So that's why you want to hold it down get at the, the angle, get like that this. middle. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Perfect. There you go. Now when you see the inside of the barrel lit, then take it out, give it a blow, and then take a draw. That's a lot better. And see, when you draw on it, every time you draw on it, you're 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 uh, you're keeping it lit. Gotcha. With the airflow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It, I mean, it's pretty much like the same science. I used to smoke a lot of weed, <laughs> so it's the same science. I, too, have smoked quite a share of weed in, 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 uh, in, the, in the day. And so that's actually, like, been, like, an issue with me as far as smoking cigars and hookah. How you said the young lady that introduced you to the cigar, first thing she said was don't inhale. Right. I never really, and I'm still learning how to I always smoke everything like a blunt. So like well, I, I don't do hookah because I would get lightheaded because I would like inhale it. Right. Right. But with with cigars you can't inhale. 
right? It's more so. You didn't in, you didn't inhale when you smoke blunts. When I smoke blunts, no, I did. Oh, okay, what I'm okay. saying is I smoke everything else like I smoke. Oh, blunts. okay, I got you. you I got me? you. I got yeah. you. Yo, cause you know what? I'm trying to think. Did I? Cause when I used to smoke hookah, I did. I, I smoked it like I smoked the blunt. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's probably why I got buzzed so quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I would get lightheaded because I hit it like a blunt. And you know what? I'm gonna say this, man. It's like I don't. For you know, for anybody you know, to see this man, like whatever you smoke is whatever you smoke. Yeah. Enjoy, enjoy what you do. Yeah, right? I used to smoke black and miles. I'm not sitting there saying that I want you to stop smoking what you smoke and smoke a premium cigar. I'm just saying, smoke whatever you like, whatever makes you happy. Yeah. But there is a a strict difference because like people who don't smoke anything, right? They don't know the difference. They think right. these are big cigarettes because mm. they don't know. Right. Right. So what is the difference between smoking a cigar and smoking a cigarette? So. Oddly enough, big tobacco is is mostly cigarette companies, right? You know, um, because whereas a you know you go to a factory somewhere they can churn out a few hundred cigars per hour, a menu a cigarette company because they're all machine made they yeah. can turn out tens of thousands of cigarettes in an hour, right? Cigarettes are made with tobacco. Yep. You know, like we live in North Carolina, you know, it's tobacco road. tobacco road. You know, most of the tobacco that's grown around here is cigarette tobacco, right? Okay. So it is tobacco, but it's not, it's, it's a different type of seed, uh, kind of like difference in wines. And, you know, if you drink whiskey, like differences in, you know, uh, you know, barleys or rice and, you know, wheats and stuff like this. It's a different type of seed and it's processed a different way. Mm -hmm. But the biggest difference is that cigarettes have a laundry list of added chemicals sprayed to the tobacco before it's stuffed in that little white paper right. tube. Yeah. Whereas premium cigars have no chemicals added to them. All of this is is sun, water, tobacco, and time. Mm -hmm. That's it. No additives, no preservatives. So do you smoke them the same way? Like oh no, okay. No, do no, do no, I don't no. know uh, cigarettes? Do cigarette smokers inhale it like a blunt? So I've only ever smoked one cigarette in my life. Yeah. I know people who smoke cigarettes. Uh -huh. I see them, you know, inhale it and, and stuff like this. So I will assume, yeah. But uh, cigarettes, like cigar, you can't inhale cigars because there's no filter. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It'll tear your ass like up. If, that's why people tell you, like, the first rule of smoke cigars, don't inhale. Don't because inhale. if you do, it'll probably be your last one. Yeah. You don't cough. Yeah. This is heavy, thicker smoke. Right. Right. So that's why you kind of treat it like mouthwash. Yeah. You hold it in your mouth, you taste the, the flavors of it, and then. You don't spit it out. You just kind of open your mouth and let yeah. it go out. Yeah, I've, so far, so I haven't inhaled. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I haven't right. inhaled. But um, yeah, like I just like you, you taste it once this in there, and then once the smoke leaves, like you taste like the flavors and whatnot, and it's right. it's pretty refreshing actually. So, so the thing about okay, so this isn't for you for right now. This could, this will be for you for later on, right? There is this thing that we do in cigar community called retrohaling, right? Retro so, what? what's it called? All right, so I remember when we was kids, and, and you know, we different generations, right. but we have shared experiences. When we was kids, you know, and uh, mom used to try to get you to take some medicine right. or whatever. Yeah. If you didn't like the taste of it, what you do? Pinch your nose. nose. Yeah. Why did she do that? So you, it cuts off half of your your um, you taste senses. Your, your taste buds. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. see, the thing is, your nose and your mouth work together that to perceive don't. flavor. Okay. Yeah, it's called olfactory senses and gustatory senses, right? So I'm bringing that up to say is that we do this thing called a, a retro hail, where and we typically do it with a new cigar that we, you know when we never had, and we do it once every third, right? So this is a third, this is a third, and then uh, the last third. Yeah. And we do that to engage more of our nasal palate, so we can really f see what this tastes like. So what is like, it that you're doing exactly again? So we, what we do is we take it in and we push out a little smoke. Through, through our nose, nose right? Okay. But I'm gonna show you a way that somebody like you know, yourself or anybody else who's gonna smoke a cigar for the first time can do it to where it's not gonna send your nasal passage. Okay. So what I'm about to show you, and I always give credit to people who taught me stuff. Okay. Uh, there was this there was this old guy. His name was Arsenio Ramos. who lived in Nicaragua. He was a Cuban expatriate. He used to be uh, the master blender for this company called Aganorsa, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he died a few years ago. He taught 
one of my guys who's a, he was company as a sponsor for Charlotte Cigar Week, Rainer Lorenzo with mm -hmm. HBC, he taught him how to do this. Rainier taught me, and now yeah. I'm going to teach you. All right. right. So going. this is what you do. You take, you take a. Uh, no, I'm, I'm gonna show you first. Okay. Let me get it lit because I was sitting there talking. <laughs> and uh, oh, there you go. Check it out. So, you're, what you're essentially going to do is you're going to smoke the cigar like normal, except you're not going to let the smoke escape your mouth yet. Okay. She's lit. Even valid. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it in my mouth, uh -huh. and then I'm going to cut my hand in front of my nose and my mouth, and I'm going to slowly blow it out, and I'm going to waft my hand in front of my nose. But as I do that, I'm going to smell the smoke mm -hmm. that's coming out of my mouth. Okay. It'll give me essentially the same effect of doing a retro hair. Because I'm engaging my palate with yeah. my nasal passages right. without burning my nasal passages. Yeah. Oh, okay. And see, now, I, when you do that, you get a, a much better idea of what the master blender intended for you to taste yeah. when he blended this cigar. Okay. Yeah. So you can do the same thing. Just so take it in your mouth and hold it in, and then cup your hand in front of your nose and your mouth. And then slowly blow it out and just slowly wipe your hand and sniff the smoke as it's coming out. Open it way, excuse me, open it way up. But I I taste it more so than I did from just regular smoking it. Well, yeah, because like when you are, when you're, it doesn't matter when you're smoking, eating, drinking, if you don't engage your nose, your nasal yeah. passages, your, right. your olfactory senses, you're only getting half of what that thing tastes like. Man, I feel like my... This, you know, sinuses like, just opened up. So actually. check this out. <laughs> so something that everybody can relate to. Yeah. When you when you got a cold, uh -huh. when you got a, uh, when you're stuffy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, food and everything. Is, people always Can't say, "Oh it. man, it's like I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to go to a restaurant to eat something because I ain't gonna be able to taste Can't it. Taste Why? Because you're stuffy. Right. And there's nothing wrong with your tongue and your mouth. It's your a nasal nose. passage. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. So let's uh let's talk about the drinks, because um. You said you can tell what cigar to recommend for somebody based off of their drinks. Like I told you, I like dark. Well, based on what they usually drink. Yeah. You know, what they prefer. So how do drinks and cigars go hand in hand? And and what do we have right now going with our cigar? So right now, uh, shout out to my guy, Preston. Uh, we are drinking right now Uncle Nearest. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the reason I chose Uncle Nearest is because you know, Uncle Nearest is a black-owned company, right? And, and it's also a woman-owned company, right? Um Uncle Nearest was a man. His name was Nearest Green. He he's the one who taught young Jack Daniels how to make whiskey. how to make whiskey. Wow. Yeah. It's usually like that, right? <laughs> Where right. you know some some inventor. I'm gonna just say some inventor. I don't want to talk about. They get credit for something that they picked up from someone else. Right. Do you think Colonel Sanders really came up with those herbs and spices? <laughs> really. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Colonel Sanders. Okay, but cause so, all right, so so check this out, right? Uh -huh. I was watching this cooking show, and uh, it's like one of the cooking like competition shows, right? Yeah. And they had this uh, this um, this Vietnamese cat on there. I don't think he was a cook or he was a judge, but it was making some type of um, a traditional Vietnamese chicken okay. meal, right? Yeah. Well, come to find out, you know, this cat he ended up telling the story that it's not traditional Vietnamese. It wasn't something they came up with. Mm -hmm. Uh, black soldiers, when they were, oh, you know, in war and going to no Vietnam, they taught them how to make this dish. And now it became a traditional, traditional. Vietnamese yeah. chicken yeah. dish. Wow. That's crazy. I know. That is crazy. It makes sense, though. I, yeah. knew, I knew it was coming. So you said Vietnam and chicken. I was like, okay. Look, the, black so, the, black, the brothers in Nam, they went over and, 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 and dropped some sauce on them. Bro, let me tell you something. We dope. We dope as shit, bro. <laughs> we dope. Um, and I don't even say this to like be on some, you know, discriminate anybody else, any other ethnicities or races, but we are literally the supreme beings, if you ask me. Well, we are the uh, we, we are the first people. Yeah, we are the first people for yeah. sure. I mean, it's, it's it's just like what are we not good at? We can last in the sun. 
We got rhythm. Well, some of us a little bit better than others, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, when you know uh, what, what, what they used to say, like, "Oh man, you look like a master kind of dipped down in the slave room." <laughs> I would have like, look, man, I ain't got no control of them. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, At least I got some melanin. Yeah, yeah, nah, nah. So, so what are you biracial? Like, yeah, what's your? So okay. my mom is black. Okay, dad is white. My dad, I. You know what? I'm gonna tell you right now. Folks have this, you know. There's this thing that goes around in our community, in the black community, you know, where folks always talk about, you know, ain't shit dads and dads and around. I'm tell you, like, man, that that is that is not racial because I have not seen my dad since I was three years old. Wow. Seen or heard from him? No, I heard from him when yeah. he found the courage to find his. Well, he when we when he found his courage in the bottom of a bottle of alcohol. Got you. Then you know he would call. Yeah. You know he lived in another state, but he was only two and a half hours away. Mm. You know what I mean? And uh, you know he, I think I looked him up when I had my first daughter when I was thirty. You know when when you have a child, you kind of and, you, and you're missing certain parts of your life. You start to try to want to find out different pieces yeah right because one thing that i always say is that we are a combination of three things you are a combination of your genetic code uh your the things that you were taught early in life in your family and then just experiences that you have when you go out into the world right and i can account for two of those things i couldn't account for the other half of mm. my biology yeah you know because i looked at myself as an adult i'm like why do I love to shoot pool and don't nobody in my family like to shoot pool? Right. I didn't pick this up from them. You know, my mom was an avid reader, so am I, but my mom reads a lot of uh, uh, religious doctrine, you okay. know, in Christian books. Yeah. I love nonfiction works and how-to books and, and, and stuff like this. Well, where did I get that from? I didn't get it from her. So, you know, consequently, when I went and looked my dad up after I had my first daughter when I was 30, like this is probably like around when I was 32. Mm -hmm. This was when you could go to the internet, you go do a white page search and you could print off yeah. like all these people. So I went and looked them up. I started in Georgia where I knew he lived. I didn't know he still lived. And I just started going down the list, right? And I think I got to page three before I found him. Okay. You know what I mean? And then, you know, once he and I started talking, that's what I started finding out like, oh, I got this shit from you. Mm. Like you never knew there's something genetic, like liking to shoot pool and being good at it that, that you be, got from somewhere that else. That passed down. That he passed, because He's a pool hustler, or he was. He, he died, like recently. But uh, but yeah, you know, this, this, I just find this shit real interesting, man. And being a father myself of two girls, I could not imagine not being in my daughter's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I have one daughter. She's four. She lives here in Charlotte. I have another daughter who's 18. She lives in Tennessee. And I go. I you know, since I moved here in 2016. I drive back and forth to Nashville eight to ten times a year to go get her, bring her up here. You know, how far is that drive to Nashville from here? Seven and a half hours. What's What's Nashville like? I want to visit. Nashville is a dope city. Yeah. So, which is where you're from, right? Yeah. No. Okay. You know, I, I, I say Nashville, Tennessee, is my home, but okay. that's not where I was born or raised. You know, I was born in Georgia. I was raised in Mobile, Alabama. Okay. But I always say I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, because I became the man I am yeah. in Nashville. Got you. You know, because I went to school at TSU, and then after graduation, you, you, you tend to become a Nashvillean sometimes. Right. So I lived in Nashville from the time I was 18 for the 22 years, mm. and then I moved to Charlotte, you know. And, uh, you know, but one of the things that I found out when I moved to Charlotte is that there's a lot of people who live in Charlotte and not – people like us who are transplants but people who grew up here mm -hmm. they always want to make charlotte to be like close to atlanta yeah and i had to go do my research because back in the day like back in the 70s and 80s charlotte was called little atlanta because there were a lot of people from atlanta who were moving up to charlotte right mm -hmm. but they're not calling it that for the same reason they're calling charlotte little atlanta now because they think that they're like sister cities and i'm here to tell you Charlotte is not anything like Atlanta. It's actually more like Nashville. Like in, in what way? Why do you say that? In a lot of ways. You look at all right. Charlotte has football. Mm -hmm. Charlotte has uh, basketball. Basketball, right? Uh, its major industry here is banking and finance. Right. And a lot of jobs come off of banking and finance. Right. Right. They also have a lot of people, half the people who live in Charlotte ain't from Charlotte. Yeah, shit, I say vast majority at this point. <laughs> and that's us. Yeah. Half the people who live here ain't yep. from here, yep. right? Okay, look at Nashville. Nashville has 
football. It doesn't have basketball, but it's it's so close in Memphis that everybody in Nashville supports the Memphis Grizzlies. How far is Memphis from Nashville? Uh, two and a half hours. Okay, gotcha. Right? So, and then Nashville's major industry is healthcare, and mm-hmm. a lot of the jobs come off the healthcare industry. Right. And it also has a great entertainment, and half the people who live in Nashville ain't from Nashville. Mm. You know, the the thing that Charlotte has better than Nashville is public transportation. Okay, and because, I'm I'm big on that. <laughs> Nashville is one of them it's like a is nashville and charlotte okay I'm, I'm gonna go back i can't remember the young lady's name that uh you had an interview with what she was talking about charlotte is not the south lonnie shout so, out to lonnie charlotte is a south but to your point when you say it, it's just not the deep south right it's the mid-south that's how I see i've it. always said that charlotte is like a mid-south you know uh he kind of has like like northeastern vibes because a yeah. lot of people live here from like philly from New, New York, York from uh, Jersey, man, the, the, the New York driving you know, license, D- DMV area. Time, yeah, yeah. that was like it was a bunch of folks, you know. So you got that 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 flavor, right? But it's still like a mid south city, right? You know, Nezreal is a mid south city, you know what I mean? But you know, like think before I left Nezreal, it was it became the it city. It, it, it kind of first started with Hurricane Katrina, because so people were leaving Hurricane, leave New Orleans, New Orleans, and they were going to Mobile, Alabama, uh-huh. and they were coming up to Nashville, Tennessee, because okay. I met a lot of people, right? Yeah. And then later on, there was a um, there was something published in some magazine saying Nashville is the it city. It's one of the top ten cities to live, mm. and now it's also become the bachelorette capital of was the United this States. Recently? Oh, like in the past five or six years. Okay. The bachelorette capital of the United States, wow. right? But like I said, the thing that Charlotte has better than Nashville is public transportation with the with the light rail. Right? Yeah, po- folks have been trying to get that in Nashville for years, man. Mm-hmm. But it has a lot of old money. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't want those public like light rails traveling through their old neighborhoods. Mm, okay, kind of like Myers Park yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Cause, here's cause, Borough Village in Nashville. Okay, because. Out here, the light rail don't go through like South Park and Myers Park and all yeah, that. Yeah, right? it, it doesn't. What I'm yeah. saying is, in Nashville, it would have to. It, oh, would, it would be equivalent got of traveling through, through Myers Park. Got you. Got you. I see you what, what you're saying. Mean? I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, real quick, back to the drinks. So, yeah, the thing. So, yeah, we drinking Uncle Nearest, and Uncle Nearest is somebody I rock with that just told you about the history of Nearest Green, a little bit of it. And uh, I asked for that because, you know, Uncle Nearest has been rocking with me ever since I've been doing multi-day cigar events. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, so one of the things I try to do with my sponsors is you, you mess with me, I always mess with you back. Mm-hmm. I try to always find opportunities to put them on the pedestal, get them some shine, you know, let them know about, you know, what they do. What is it that goes, why do drinks go so good with a cigar? Like, what is it about, what even makes that blend a blend to begin with? And why is it so good? That's a good question, man. Cause he's not like I don't even drink a lot. I I drink, but I don't I don't drink a lot. This is like my main vice is, is cigars, right? The, the the thing that I have probably with cigars more often than not is coffee. Okay. You know, I have like a little Q, cafe cubano, a cubanito, like a you know, Cuban espresso or something like that. Um, my if I'm gonna drink alcohol, my preferred alcohol type is rum, just because of the fact that for me and my palate. Rum goes better with cigars because the natural sweetness that you get in because it's made out of sugar cane, mm-hmm. it helps to balance out the natural bitterness bitterness that you get in cigars. Okay. You no, know, but because you know we live in America, you know we love our whiskey. Yeah. You know whiskey is also a great pairing, but it's, it, it the, the shit is very subjective, mm-hmm. right? So you know to kind of answer your question though, it's about what the different things are made of, right? So one thing I always use is this. I was like I like ice cream uh-huh. and I like macaroni. I don't want them together though, but I do love them separately. Yeah. Why wouldn't I want them together? It's you know, the, the textures and the flavors they just yeah, don't they don't go off. well. I'm yeah. probably gonna throw up. It's gonna yeah. make me want to throw yeah. up. But see the thing with when you're drinking, like what we're drinking is uh, Uncle Nearest is drinking whiskey and having this Nicaraguan cigar. The caramel notes that you get in the whiskey because of the the barrel that is aged in mm-hmm. and stuff like this. And the sweet notes that you get from a little bit of the wheat and the, you know and and uh, and uh, you know, the rye and the, and the barley and the corn and all this kind of stuff, all those things mingle together, along with the proof 
in the alcohol to give it like a little bit of bite, mm-hmm. they kind of go well with certain cigars. Mm. And see, and it's, it's called a pairing, but pairings are a whole other conversation. They're, they're very subjective because it depends on your palate. Yeah. I could smoke this cigar and drink this and be like, oh man, this is a great pairing. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you're going to like it. Right. Right. Like you might like them individually, but when you have them together, you're like, eh, one is kind of washing out the other. I don't really mm-hmm. like the way they play on my palate. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, me personally, I like, I don't drink as much as I used to, but I like Henny. I'm, I'm, I'm falling in that stereotype, if you would. And my, uh, Man, my we old, gotta, we got to level you up, bro. My old supervisor, he'll be like, bro, why aren't you drinking whiskey? And I'll be like, I, I mean, you know, because, you know, it's, it's usually for like party types. So if I'm, you know, with a girl or whatnot, like, mm-hmm. it's like, how oh, you drink whiskey? I'm like, what's the point? He's like, it does it like it does it more potent. Like Henny, you kind of playing around with it. Why not get straight to the point with whiskey? That was his thing with me. It was mm-hmm. like, plus whiskey's a grown man drink. I was like, okay, but you know what? I'm gonna disagree with that. Okay, I think it really just has to do what you are exposed to and when you are exposed to it. Exactly. So you know I was mean? I was going to say that. So it's known black people love Henny. I want to ask you. Do you know why that is? I did a little bit of research, but I want to ask you first and foremost, why is? I it? don't know because yeah. I don't drink Henny. Yeah, I stopped drinking Henny years ago. Well, you okay? Well, you tell me. How did you even get introduced to Henny? The same way that probably everybody got introduced <laughs> exactly, to it. Your right? home boys and your home girl, like, oh, we drinking Henny. Like, yeah. oh, I'm drinking Henny. Yeah. What made you stop drinking Henny? I grew up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just yeah. grew up a little bit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? No, I so, like this whiskey. Uh, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a, I'm a make that transfer because I didn't start with Henny. I started with vodka, and then when I did do dark, it was like. So I used to do vodka a lot too. Yeah, like I, before I, I was even, heavily in the whiskey. Yeah, I was I, heavily in the vodka. Yeah, right. And when I say I'm, my my thing is this: when I whenever I get into something, I find out that I like it. This ain't for everybody, but for me. I have to like study it. I have to know like how it's made and the different ways it's made. Like you know, with with uh you know with vodka, you know it could be you know wheat or it can be grapes or right. it can be potato. Right. How many times is the steel the fix the you know the smoothest you know, the, and the flavor and all these different things, right? Yeah. I was heavily in the vodka, which is kind of odd because I lived in Nashville and Kentucky is right there, mm-hmm. and then you know you got the Jack Daniels distillery right down the street right. in uh, I think it was in uh, in uh, Lexington Lexington County Tennessee or whatever, yeah. and uh, which is Dry County, but there's a plethora of lots of whiskeys right there in Nashville. So after I started getting into whiskey, I became the same way with that that I did with vodka. I want to know like how it was made, how's the mash bill, like why is it called bourbon? You know, why cuz why can this whiskey be called bourbon but that whiskey can't be called bourbon? Right. It's like all these different rules and yeah. stuff. Bourbon, that's what he drank. He 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 drank. He's heavy on bourbon. Um so what I did, I did a little bit of research. I need to do more. But I saw that the reason why Hennessy and cognac is so you know big in the black community is because cognac is a part is a a city in France if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's why you can only be called cognac if it comes from there. Cognac, yeah. yeah. But that's you know what that's why that was the same thing with whiskey. Uh-huh. It could only be back in the day. It could only be called bourbon if it came from Bourbon County, Kentucky. Ah. But see, the United States changed the rule, so now it can be called bourbon, but it has to be certain rules. It has to be at least a fifty one percent. You know, corn mash bill. Okay. It has to be uh, aged at, at least two years in uh, in in new uh, casks. You know, those, you know, I, I, I forgot what that is, uh, but a certain type of cask it has to be aged in for at least two yeah. years. Has to be made in the United States. Okay. Right. And you know, those are you know, like general rules for something to be called bourbon. Right. Gotcha. You know, so but you have like high rye bourbons or weeded bourbons and so, but as long as that that corn mash bill is at minimum 51%. Yeah. Then there you go. All right, nice. Hey, we pick it up on cigars and drinks. Yeah. So from what I heard was that when black people, I forgot what point in time it was, were in France, mm-hmm. cognac was the only drink like they were like, had access to, like they oh, were word. like given, okay. right? They didn't give them the high. You like during the war? Yeah. Okay. They didn't give them, you know, top shelf, if you would, at the time. They would only give them, like, Hennessy Cognac, which I guess isn't as prevalent over there. Okay. And then it, like, br- brought back home with us. That's what I heard. I need to do more research on that. Okay. But, well, I mean, if that's true, I'm learning something. Yeah. Because I never yeah. even really looked into it. Yeah. It was like, it, it's kind of like, you know, the whole pig feet and chitlins. Like, we eat pig feet and chitlins things, you oh, know, because that's what we were given. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I, that's what I heard it came from. But, I mean, I don't, I if I do drink now, tequila, I mean, I, Henny is always... 
as of now, still my thing. But like I said, I don't drink as much now. I'm actually about to go on like a 75 day type thing. Vacations excluded. Vacations, I'm there for a good time. But right. But one thing I do like, I actually got uh, added something to the collection. I collect Hennessy bottles. Oh, word? Yeah. So you got the VSOP. Did, did you get the bottle where you could get your own name put on there on the I label? Didn't. But I didn't get that. I didn't know you could do that. I'm going to have to look yeah, at that. Yeah, that. that was a few years ago, man. So I only have two to the collection, but okay. they're very two great fucking pieces to have to the collection. First and foremost, I just got it yesterday was Nas. He did a collaboration with uh, Henny. So it's uh -huh. Nas on it, and it's also the celebration of the 50-year anniversary of hip-hop. Okay. All and, right. And the second one I have, which is, so I have a Obama, Barack Obama, uh, Hennessy bottle. They only made, matter of fact, let me see how many they made. That's that's so black. <laughs> but here's the thing. But here's the thing. A here's Barack the, Obama Hennessy bottle. It was when he got inaugurated. Well, it is so black because he was yeah. the first black president, right. and then it has some. It's like a one. It's some type of anniversary. Usually, whenever it's a black figure on any uh, Henny bottle, they have some type of anniversary. It's an anniversary for that as well. They only made a limited amount of these bottles. Okay. Right. My grandfather, he had it. My grandmother, one day, she's like, uh, after he passed and uh, she was moving, she's like going through his liquor cabinet and she came across the bottle. I think she was about to open it or she just really didn't think much of it. I asked if I could have it, she said, yeah. So as of today, the Barack Obama, I think it's 150 year anniversary, Hennessy bottle's worth $7,000. As of today. Wait a minute, the full or empty? Full and that oh, bottle was full. About to... No, no, that bottle full. I haven't touched it. I had it wrapped up and have it and in the safe. Seven G's. As of today. Yeah, yeah, hold on, man. Go put that somewhere where you just gonna forget about it. Oh, it's in the safe. Yeah, it's okay. in the safe. Yeah. It's wrapped up twice. It's in the safe somewhere. And my mom was like, "Well, are you gonna pass that down to your kids?" Hell no. Hell no. Even though that would be dope, I'll give them the Nas one maybe, but the Obama one. I mean, I'm gonna I'm sell it one day when I'm like. After, I mean, I'm not saying it as in I'm I'm looking forward to this to happen. But once he if he passes, you know, uh, before me and you know, it's gonna be worth more. That's what I'm saying. So once he passes and whatnot, just to really take it in, or I might not sell it. One day I, I might just be like, you know what, I don't need to sell it. If I know I'm not gonna need to sell it because I'm gonna be good. But if it's the point where I really sell it for what? It could be worth. It's probably be worth six figures one day. You know what I mean? But I still don't want to sell it unless it's like you know what. See, the thing is, it makes sense. Once you sell something, it loses its value to you because now you've exchanged it for currency. Right. Right. Holding on to it, it retains more value because it increases. Yeah. For you, it increases in monetary value, but also you have a connection to it. Right. And like I you said, I mean? got it from my grandfather. Right. I remember. So it, it's more, it means more to yeah. you yeah. to keep it yeah. than it would ever be to get any amount of money from selling it. It's exciting to know how much it's worth, though, for sure. Right. That, right, that, right. that goes feeds with the ego. Yeah, yeah. Feeds definitely the ego. feeds the ego. Like, oh, hey, you know what? I got this bottle <laughs> right here. like worth 200 Gs. <laughs> definitely feeds the but ego. But I ain't going to sell <laughs> right. it, though. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's I already know that's what's going to happen. And so I definitely... Could you know imagine you had to take over to the crib? Oh, man. And uh, she would be like, you know, and you'd be like, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, you flossing on a little bit. Yeah, you know, so yeah, I got this this a uh, henny bottle in here that yeah. I ain't never opened. You know, Barack right. Obama dish and this work two hundred G's. Right, right. And she'd be like, "When you gonna sell it? I will never sell this yeah, bottle." Yeah, yeah. She'd be like, mm. "Right." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh man, this a man of value right here. Oh, he, for real, he ain't worried you know about them couple dollars this, on it. What, what uh, Kevin Samuel said? Oh, this a high value. High man, value. Right man. Yeah, yeah. She's like, oh, that's gonna add some mystery to the equation and all that. <laughs> oh shit. Shoot, but I'm gonna tell you though, like, yeah. so all right, Henny. This is the only thing I would tell you. I'm not. I'm, I'm not trying to convince you to stop drinking Henny. You drink what you like. Only thing I would say is this: expand your horizons a bit. Yeah. Uh, how old are you? I'm 28. You 28? 28. Okay, that's what's up. All right, yeah. so you you actually in that sweet spot. Yeah. You know where we can start expanding your yeah, palate. Yeah, I see I'm, it coming. I'm 48. Mm -hmm. Right. So start expanding your palate little bit by little bit, right? Yeah. Because I, if I go back to the time when I was 28, that was two years before I had my first daughter. And, uh, you know, I was still kind of, I had, you know, had, you know, my girlfriend, of course, we were together. But, you know, I was um, still kind of wilding out. Yeah, I'm not like bit. I was when you know I was, saying? you know, 23, 24, 25, was, 21, 18. I was drinking a lot sure. of vodka then. Okay, see, yeah. and, 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 and people ask me why Henny, like, I don't drink Henny for the taste. It tastes fucking disgusting, to be quite honest, but it's where Henny gets me, especially compared well, to, What like, about Ducé? You fuck with Ducé? I don't like Ducé. What? I don't like Ducé, because- So, it, wait a minute, you like have, Henny over Ducé? Yeah, I have to drink more Ducé to get to where Henny gets me. 
Like I crush. Oh, wait, wait, yeah, wait. See, I, now I'm not talking about where it's gonna get you. I'm just talking about flavor. Oh, taste wise, do say has it. Okay, all right. Yeah. So we agree. Yeah, taste wise, right. do say have it. But I don't, again, I don't drink any for the taste. So it's like it's for the. So you look at it like those saying like candy's dandy, but liquor's quicker. So do say is candy, Henny is liquor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like that. Yep, that's exactly where it is. Um, so you mentioned you're 48, I'm 28, 20 years of 20 years of separation between the two of us. You've seen a lot. I've seen a lot at 28, so I know you've seen a lot at 48. For sure. So let me ask you, um, what are your thoughts on Gen Z and millennials today? All right, cuz so I used to work at this company um back when I lived in Nashville. And they had this, they had this little thing that they would do, like once a year, called a, the Colors of Communication, uh-huh. right? At the time I was working for them, there were four different generations in there. Mm-hmm. You had some uh, traditionalists who are on the brink of retirement. Okay. You had some baby boomers. You had Gen X, which is me. Mm-hmm. I'm actually what you call a zennial because I was born in '75, so I'm right on the cusp of millennial. Okay. I grew up with analog and digital technology. You know what I'm saying? So, but, you know, baby boomers, Gen X, and then millennials, Uh right? And everybody communicates based on their experiences, right? Millennials and Gen X, we like things to move a little bit faster, you know, because we grew with technology, right? Right. We 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 like digital things. Whereas baby boomers and traditionalists, they want paper. Things tend to move a little bit slower for them. You know what I'm saying? They have insight into things uh-huh. that because of the age that we don't have insight right. into but we move with the speed right that once we understand it we can move whereas they need to just kind of hem and haw about it a little bit more but you know the way good or y'all bad. see because you, I, I, you are a you're a you're a, you're a what gen what gen I'm, y i'm millennial i was born in 94. you're not a millennial yeah right. No, a generation is like usually like ten to fifteen years. Millennials, millennials started like right in nineteen seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty. Millennials. So you you should actually be a different generation because we're you know we're twenty years apart. So you should be like the yeah. So Gen Y or uh-huh. millennials were born between eighty one and ninety four. Okay. So you actually are not a millennial. I'm a zennial. Yeah. I'm a I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cusper. Yeah. I'm right in between. Gen X and Millennials. Okay. You know. Yeah, I was born at the very end. Ninety four. Born at the very end. I love. I love that I was born in ninety four. I was born at the end of ninety four. I was born November 29th, ninety four. So you you were born when I was a sophomore in college. Yeah. I was wilding out. I was running track. I was wilding out. Running track I, and you I was are a. Yeah, but I didn't do that until like the the, the year after that. Okay. You know what I'm saying, but uh, Omega. No, oh no, no, a homeboy who was here. He oh, was I'm an sorry, Omega. I'm That's sorry, my son. I'm, sorry. I'm an alpha. alpha. Yeah, I'm sorry. But uh, but yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I was wilding out. You know, the thing is, man, you know, that's your question. You're supposed like, to wild out in college. Yeah, you're supposed to, but I was wilding out, wilding out. You was wilding out, wilding out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, when I was saying I was wilding out, I almost got, I almost didn't go back to college the end of my sophomore year because I Why? was wilding out so much. Oh, uh, you know what I mean? Because you have to. You have to look at it from my perspective. I'm not saying I was right because I was completely wrong. Yeah. But it was just because my perspective was fucked up. Yeah. And I grew up in a in a house of a single parent, my mom or whatever. She was very strict, you know, wouldn't let me do certain things. So when I left and went to college, oh like I'm on my own. Mm-hmm. Do what I want to do. Yeah. To a degree, because I was on scholarship for track, right? So there's certain responsibilities I had. But man, if, if I wasn't at track practice. If I wasn't in the weight room, if I wasn't in study hall, uh-huh. oh, you was at some drawers. Oh, bro, I was, <laughs> dude, I had a, I, <laughs> I was telling a friend about it. I was like, I was like, damn, we were such hoes mm-hmm. back when we was in, you know, not just in our teens, but even in our twenties, man, we was such hoes. Oh, like yeah. I remember, dude, I, I was telling a friend of mine one time who didn't know this, but like when I was a sophomore, I had a rotation. Like my, my day consisted of get up, uh, go to track practice. I go run seven miles, right? I uh, know we ran five, ran five miles, we were go to running. class. Well, everybody who ran track had to run cross country for okay. condition. Gotcha, gotcha, so gotcha. we had no choice. Gotcha. All right. So you run five miles, you go to class, three o'clock, you go to track practice, uh-huh. you know what I'm saying? 
you go do a cool down, you go lift weights, you go eat, you go to study hall, go go to dorm, go shit shower and change. Then I had my little circuit. I lived in the athletic dorm. I would leave the, I leave my dorm, and then I would go to this this uh, other dorm. It was the chicks dorm or uh, a female dorm? I would go holler at this Delta I was messing with. Uh-huh. I go to another dorm. I go talk to this AKA I was messing with. And then I go to the freshman dorm with my girlfriend who was an RA, and I would spend the night in her room. And uh, the, the other RAs, they they knew me, uh-huh. so it's like they didn't have visitation. Guys weren't supposed to be in there, but they yeah. knew me. They're like, just come on in, you good. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Patrice would be in her room uh-huh. when she finished her shift or whatever. Yeah, that was my normal, like a normal day. Oh, so you had them in the same day? You would make those oh, the rounds. same night. Oh, same night. This is the rounds. same night. I'm thinking it's like I'm one hour over Monday, here, Tuesday, Wednesday, one hour Thursday. No, oh. this is the same night, bro. The same night. <laughs> Smooth one hour over here, one hour over there, the rest of the night over here. Yeah. You know, I was such a hoe. But so I, I've grown up. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now so you would, so, so you would have sex with multiple in one day. And I ask because, yeah. really. like, dude, you know how that was when you was like yeah, 19, was 20, easy, 20, yeah. like, yeah. Like, I've dude, never, they, so same day. fucking like a jackrabbit. Me personally, same day, I think two was the most. I've never done three or more. Look, all these wasn't like, uh, long sexual experience. Some of these, most of these shit was like, you know, 15, 20 minute quickies. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? College. So then you get back to your girl's <laughs> dorm, you know, she ain't gonna, she right. ain't gonna wanna, you know, get right, down right. with you as soon as she come in. She right, gonna come right. in, she's gonna so, take a shower. Yeah, 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 she gotta yeah, see yeah. do a homework. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah. Then, you know, by like 12, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, yeah. whatever, she roll over, like, all right, now it's time to get busy. Yeah, again. okay, you know I, mean? I got you, I got you. I and plus, you. you know, I was running track, so I had, I had a lot of damn stamina. Yeah. So it was like energy, you know, I, I testosterone, was stamina. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, working out, it does create testosterone, which does. Okay, so that part yeah, does make sense. Exactly. Don't they have we going? And don't care, Sean. Uh, we, we've been talking about a lot of different shit, man. It's like, this is how Cigar Lounge conversations typically go. Like, if we weren't doing this interview, right. we would still be sitting there talking about talking the, the same, same shit. shit. You, this is one you, thing you, I love about Cigar you, you and my man's that was here earlier. I forgot his name. Yeah, I didn't but, even I didn't even get his name. Yeah. Because we would just start talking. But you I don't even thought, know him. You would have thought y'all known each other for years. No, nah, because, see, that's a, if, if I could leave folks with one thing who don't smoke cigars, it would be this, is that the kind of people and the type of interactions that you have over cigars is not like you would have at a bar. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, you go to a bar. When I say a bar, I mean, because this is a cigar bar, which means they sell cigars and they sell alcohol. Right. But you go just to a bar right. where there's only alcohol yeah. being sold. You sitting there talking to somebody and both of y'all have three or four drinks apiece. Your conversation is going to change. Right. Because your mentality is going to change. Right. The alcohol is going to start right. affecting you. We could sit there and smoke three, four cigars. Ain't nothing going to happen. Other than, you know, we're just going to talk about a lot of different it's the same shit. level of convo. It's the same level. We have the same, same mindset. Level. We're not belligerent. And, and, exactly. Yeah. You know, because alcohol, all, you know, the more alcohol you drink, it just tends to, it's kind of like money and power and also being mad. Right. The real you starts to come out the yeah. more you, in, in, right. you know, get into it. With yeah. cigars, it's, it's just cool. You know, that, and that's, and you had asked me this kind of like in the, in the very beginning. And, uh my answer is this the thing that i love about cigars it's not really the what about cigars mm-hmm. it's the why about cigars it's it's why i smoke and 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 what it does for me yeah. i could smoke cigars by myself on my patio at the crib and just listen to some music or read a book and chill out or i can be in the lounge with some of my homeboys and we just see me talk about sports or talk about women or or, or relationships, or kids, or politics, whatever. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, and it just flows. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like a pretty much like a podcast, just without the cameras and whatnot. Which, Every cigar conversation that happens is a podcast without the camera and mic. It truly is. Like if you could just randomly go into a cigar lounge one day, right, yeah. and then take your phone and just put it on record uh-huh. and just let it go you would be amazed at yeah. the number of conversations you end up picking up. Sometimes that you might even be a part of it. You'd be like, damn, man, this shit is dope. Right. I didn't know they talk about this kind of shit. Yeah. Because it's so crazy. Like, all right, you go into a cigar lounge. Like, you look at where we are in Taylor Smoke. 
if we was out there in the lounge part or whatever, you know, you'd have people from the, the typical cigar smokers probably like early 30s to like in their mid 50s for mm -hmm. people who like come out mm -hmm. right and you meet people from all different walks of life the great thing about cigars is that it doesn't care about your gender it doesn't care about your political affiliation doesn't care about your age doesn't care about your background doesn't care about your race doesn't care about your socioeconomic economic status you know one of the great things about cigars is that gets propagated throughout the cigar community is that this is the great equalizer you can be the guy who owns the company or the guy who sweeps the floors for that hour that you're smoking a cigar you're on a level playing field it's a con it's a common denominator i love it yeah because like we we be in cigar lounge you know you you'll meet people who are like just so full of themselves and all they want to talk about is themselves and yeah and I was kind of, you'll you'll run into them kind of right, kids, right, right? right, right but right. for the mass majority of people you run into they're just cool people they're just like everyday people who just like i, I won't even always say just the finer things in life it's just more they just love cigars they love they might not know a lot about cigars because you don't have to right but they just enjoy what the cigar does for them and the environment mm -hmm. that it affords to them mm. Let me ask you something. Is there like any type of party foul for dropping a cigar? Like for weed smokers, they say if you drop a blunt, then like, uh, what is it? Like someone smashing your girl or something like that. It's the same way with spilling alcohol by mistake. You know, exactly. we just say, oh, you spill some alcohol by mistake, get in the cut. What that mean? Um, <laughs> get in the cut mean like you, you grab your nets, you bend over, yeah. and then somebody kick you in your uh, ass. You know okay. what I'm saying? <laughs> we talk about getting the cut. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, but that's you know, a, party foul. Party foul is definitely one of them. Is sma like when you finish your cigar, uh -huh. smashing it out in the uh -huh. ashtray. Yeah, don't ever do that. You know, it, oddly enough, man, there's quite a few party fouls, right? Let's so one through. of them is the smashing the cigar. Because reason you don't do that is because when you smash it out, for one, it's disrespectful to the cigar. This is a handmade product. This is an artisan product, mm -hmm. and there's not really a lot of these in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's. They say that. On average, 300 pairs of hands have touched this cigar from the time it was, the seed was put into the dirt yeah. until the time you picked it up. And Makes so sense. your hand is one of those 300 yeah, pairs number of hands. Yeah, number 300 right now. Right? Because you look at, because you look at where cigars are made, they're made in, you know, third world countries for the most part, right? So seed planted into a little pot when it grows up, planted out into the field, yep. and then watering it, cultivating it. Picking it, curing it, yeah. priming it, you know, I mean, in, you know, the fermenting it, aging it, and then making it to a cigar, right. then banding it, yeah. then shipping it, yeah. then it delivering it, yeah, all yeah. of that shit. Wow. You know what I mean? This is a, this is a truly an artisan product, man. And so you don't want to disrespect the art of the cigar by smashing it out. But from a scientific and more of a, I guess more of a courtesy standpoint, when you're in an area with other people, when you smash your cigar, it creates a foul odor. Mm. And now you left, and you left this foul odor for everybody for else you got else. to deal with until yeah. the ad ashtray gets empty. So right. what you typically do, you finish with, just put it down, just it'll leave, burn out. Lay it to yeah, rest. it'll burn out. Another part of foul is don't, don't uh, use somebody else's cutter, whether it's the house cutter or your friend's cutter, and lick your cigar before you cut it. That's just unsanitary. That's nasty. Why do people do that? Why would someone lick it before? That's an old thing. Uh -huh. Like, so back in the day, like, like I mean, years ago, uh -huh. before like humidors and humidity packs came out and stuff like this, yeah. cigars weren't properly humidified all the time. They put them in like some cigar box or whatever, mm -hmm. and you know, they might dry out. So what they do is, it would be common to take your cigar and you lick the whole cigar uh, to kind of moisten it up so when you cut it, you didn't crack it. Okay. But you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Because cigars become properly humidified. They're going to be in a, in a cigar lounge. They're going to be properly humidified. Yeah. If you store them at home, they're going to be properly right. humidified. You don't have to do that. Just that, cut it. That's um like with, I used to smoke, I used to roll up cigarillos when I smoked weed. Mm -hmm. Those real weed smokers, they know what I'm talking about with the cigarillos. We would lick it before we would split it down the middle uh -huh. to make it easier to split so it wouldn't crackle everywhere. So you're talking to it. a former weed smoker. Yeah. I feel you. you know, we, I, used to, I used to roll honey blunts back in the day. Honey so, blunts? Yeah. All right. What about Phillies? Did you ever roll up Phillies? So uh, we use Phillies, we use White Owls, and White we Owls. use Swishers. Swishers, you know yep. what I'm saying? We, 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 yep. we use all of those, and we just use... I, I learned this from my homeboys from Memphis. It's like, just take, take a little honey. So what we would do is we take it, right? And instead of licking the whole wrapper to kind of make it moist before you got ready to roll the weed up in right. it, we take a little honey 
and we smear it around it on the whole inside of the wrapper, right? Because okay. that that made it moist without licking it, right? Uh -huh. But it also made it burn slower. Ooh. And then when you put the weed in it, it made it stick yeah. right there. Yeah. So when you roll it up and stuff, you know how sometimes you used to do a a, a, a joint, uh -huh. you'd have to roll both of the ends right. and stuff like this. Right. Well, with that, you didn't have to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it was perfect all the way through. I saw a Snoop Dogg once uh, put a blunt in the microwave. He said that helps it burn slow. So we did that after. So what we would do, we put the honey on there and then we would roll the blunt, right? And then we stick it in the microwave for like five to six seconds, right? And then what that did was it made the, with the little clothes, when you, when you wrap it, it made it stick, mm. you know what I mean? And then it made it, but it also made it stiff because after you put the honey on there, it's kind of, you know, yeah, a little, little, you know what I'm saying? Sticky, loose, yeah. yeah. Well, now it's, it's sticky, but it was like, it was pliable, it was like you could bend loose, it. Loose. And yeah. you didn't want that. Right. You want a stiff blunt. Right. Let me ask you this. Like I said, it's 20 years of separation between the two of us. What's something you would tell 28-year-old Damon? Getting a cigar industry. Mm. And so, that in, in our community, in the cigar community, we had this thing that's called you know, cigar community, the cigar industry, and the cigar culture, right? Yeah. So the cigar industry are the people who actually work in the industry. You know, uh -huh. the people grow tobacco, like, you know, people here who sell and experience, people who legislate tobacco, uh, you know, reps who go to different stores to get the, those are people who work in the industry. Mm -hmm. Then you got people like me who are in the cigar community, people who smoke cigars, we put on cigar events and stuff like this or whatever. But all of those two things, they fall under the whole banner of the of the cigar culture. Okay. So I would tell 28 year old me, learn about cigars and start getting into the cigar industry mm -hmm. now. Because that's why, you know, one thing I want to do is I want to have my own brand. I want to transition from the community mm -hmm. to the industry, yeah. right? So it would have been a hell of a lot easier if I started 20 years ago. Nice. So outside of like the, uh, you know, industries and like the monetary standpoints of things, like just life advice in general. What would just you life tell? Life advice, man. Yeah. Oh, shit. I've made so many mistakes over the past 20 years. It, it, it's hard to just get down on one, but I think one thing I would say is this. I would tell myself, Stop sticking and moving as much. What do you mean by that? Women. Mm. Be more about quality than quantity. Because, mm. you know, as young men, I'm going to say this, this, this doesn't apply to all young men, but for the mass majority of us, when we're younger, that's what we're doing, man. You know, we we sticking and moving and yeah. stuff like this. It's a badge of honor to us. Yeah, you know, us. right, right. You know what I mean? But as you get older, you start looking back on those experiences, especially like when you become a father and then you got daughters, right? You know, Nas had this song where he was talking about, he, uh, you know, God gives former players daughters. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah, you hear and, it. All, you hear it and you see it. Yeah. You see it all the you time. I mean? Like so whenever a dude had a whole bunch of girls and was running through girls, they always say their first kid or their kids in general is gonna be girls. Yeah. And I got two of them. Right. <laughs> there you go. So you know, as a father, one thing I think about is. I do. Do you want your daughter to meet the forty-eight-year-old you, or the twenty-eight-year-old you? Yeah. I want her to meet the forty-eight-year-old me, the one who's more settled in his ways, who ain't out here sticking and moving and all this kind of stuff, and he's he's very comfortable right. in his own skin. Yeah. Very comfortable being alone. Yeah. Right. Because the thing is, like, there's a you know, and I I touch on this briefly. There's a difference between being alone and being lonely, right? And as when, as you get older, you understand that difference because you've experienced it, but then you get comfortable in both of those. You get comfortable being in a space, being alone, and sometimes when you're lonely, you get that too. Yeah. So, you know, I want my daughter to meet the more mature version of me when she gets, uh, when they get of age to start dating and stuff. I don't want, I don't want her to meet the 28 year old me because 28 year old me was a real, a hoish asshole. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you find that fine line? Because you see instances where some uh, father is very stern on their daughter, only going 
doing this in life, and that can actually attract them to do the opposite. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. <clears throat> How do you find um, that fine line? So what I do with my daughters, man, I had to learn that unlike sons, daughters require a different type of love. You know, um, with boys, we can be a more you know, stern with them and strict with them and, and all this kind of stuff. We can kind of beat them up, so yeah. to speak, or whatever, make them tough, yeah. right? You don't want to do your girls like that. You don't want to make your girls tough, like physically tough. You want to make your girls emotionally aware. You want to make them smart. You want them to be loving but not be gullible, right? You don't. You want your daughters to look at you as my dad is a protector. He's a provider. He's also a safe space. Like I can feel comfortable telling my dad anything, mm -hmm. not because he's going to be cool with it, but because he's going to help me see where I was wrong. And he's going to try to guide me in the right direction. Not that he's going to beat me up over it. You see what I mean? Yeah. And unfortunately there are some fathers out there who are, they're so super strict. Well, their, their daughters are scared to go talk to them. I would never want my daughters to be scared to come talk to me about anything, you know, cause I tell them all the time. I was like, tell me the truth, no matter how bad it is, no matter what you think I'm going to say, tell me the truth. Because if you don't tell me the truth, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you know I'm going to find out the truth. Then I'm going to be mad. Yeah. And I'm going to feel disrespected that you didn't feel like you could trust me enough to tell me the truth. Yeah. So I just try to provide a, a safe space for my daughters to talk to me, man. Wow. You know, but at the same time providing strict love. Yeah. That's great advice, man. That's beautiful. That's great advice. You got any kids? I don't. I have a dog. You have a dog? Yeah. You have a kid? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much, right? Especially during those first two years. You have a oh, kid, Bill, at least. I got, a, I got a kid on four legs. That puppy stage was no joke. But now I don't have kids. Um, I'm just not... People ask me about... I'm 28. People ask me about kids and marriage and whatnot. That's not even on my mind right now. Like, it's not even close. And then also, you know, shout out to my mom. She had me at 15. Uh, mm -hmm. She had me at 18, my brother at 15. Mm -hmm. So growing up, she always emphasized to me, don't have kids right now. I would agree. Right? Because she was agree. like, yo, she was like, I didn't really get to live life until my 30s. She would always tell me that. And like, she's like, don't have kids. Live your life. Do your thing. Date. Wrap it up. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that was her sex talk with me. Just don't have kids right now. Don't do it. She, I mean, since since eighth grade. You know what I mean? Because I, 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 you know, at an early age, man. But I, see, here's the thing, though, man. You know, my mom, uh -huh. you know, she was. She had those same conversations with me about don't be bringing her no kids, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know, because you know, I was in high school and yeah. going off to college or whatever. But, you know, the conversation that she didn't have with me that she in, in retrospect, being a father now mm -hmm. that she should have had with me was that don't have sex. Because mm -hmm. when you tell your kids don't bring don't don't have kids, you're telling them is I know you're going to have sex. Yeah. Just stay protected. Yeah. Don't. You know what I'm saying? And for a lot of guys, I don't, you can chime in this one if you want to. But I know there's been a lot of times in my past where I've done that push and pull method. Where well, you been what? That I've done that push and pull method. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know that. Push and pull, pull out? Yeah, you, you, sometimes your pull out game ain't strong, bro. Yeah, my pull you know out is my pull out's like 98% effective. <laughs> <laughs> but look, everybody don't have a great pull out game, yeah, man. You yeah, know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, you know, motherfuckers can get pregnant off pre -com. That is a fact. You know what I'm saying? And you, you don't know when that's coming out. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So the best thing to do is, that, you know, and like I said, I'm, I'm, looking this, I'm, I'm looking at this with eyes that are 20 years older than you and they having two daughters. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to tell my daughters not to have any kids. I'm going to tell my daughters don't have sex until you get to a point where, because here's the thing, man. Sex is really an adult thing, mm -hmm. right? The purpose of sex is to do what? To procreate. The reason yeah. that it feels good is to make us want to do it, yeah. right? But there's far too many of us who have had kids in our past, we were not mentally and emotionally mature enough to have kids. And if you're not mentally and emotionally mature enough to have kids, you shouldn't be mentally and emotionally mature enough to have the sex that leads to do the act having of, kids. Yeah, You know what I mean? But, you know, sex is... Casual sex is such always has been such a, a prevalent part of our culture that having that conversation is almost like talking to a brick wall. Like, man, ain't nobody gonna yeah. not do that. So the best thing I would say now, man, just always strap up. You know, the yeah. brothers, if you don't want kids, 
don't do something that's going to allow you to possibly get kids. Stay yeah. strapped up. Yeah. I don't care what she say. 100% assure, assure 100 the situation. Stay strapped up. Um, as a tw I've, I'm 28. 27 is when I truly realized the power of being in control of your sexual urges, just in general. I went on like a five month celibacy thing, which is good for me. Five right. months. I mean, I'm not saying I'm Walt Chamberlain. I did, I did a year before. A year, and and yeah. and it was life changing. I assume, right? As far as the mental, just you evaluating like the power that it brings to be able to, you know, do something else instead of just constantly chasing ass. No, you're right. So, all right. Tell and the about, power that it gives tell, you. Tell me about your experience before I tell you about mine. Tell me so, about yours. Like, what was it like for you? So, I just realized, for one, how how much time and energy we waste. Mm -hmm. And that could be a number of things. Going on dates, just the leading up to sex. Because the slightest... The possibility of it. Yeah, the possibility of it. The right. slightest thing we do, it attriculates. But with the slightest thing we do that leads up to it, that's time consuming. And when it, it adds is. up for one woman, the shit we do from texting her all day, talking to her, taking her out, just all of that, showing the interest when the end goal in mind is getting that ass, that takes up a lot of time that you could have put towards you being 28 years old, that time you could have put towards the cigar industry, getting I established. Put towards anything. Anything, right? Anything. anything productive, right? Yeah. That, and then for two, especially today with women, with social media, I mean, they just, their ego is just stroked all day, every day. Instagram is like soft core porn. Yeah, so like soft porn. for them to come across a dude that's not pressed about that, oh man. Attention is currency. Yeah. You oh, always yeah. have to be mindful of where you spend it, there it is. and how much you spend it, you know what I mean? Because yeah, to your point, you look at Instagram, you look at some random chick, she's taking a bunch of photos, like always with her in bikinis or yeah. she's in lingerie yeah. or she's advertising for some company or not you know and she's got 20 million followers yeah. and you know you looking at any, any picture she's got you look at her comments there's always dudes i'm hey beautiful hey queen all day i was kind of seeing that just like man she keeps scrolling exactly keeps so scrolling. so it's like you you don't you're not falling into that majority of dudes that's in that pool so right. you already stand out on that aspect right this is a good conversation we have. Yeah, and, and just in general, I don't know, man. It's just something different that you realize when you are just, you have sexual, uh, what's the word? Discipline. You have sexual discipline. It just saves you from so much. It just really puts you on another level to where that's not all you're driven off of, man. I mean, it's dudes that everything they do is about women, about getting some ass. Everything they do. All the time, every every piece of money they get, vast majority of it either goes towards clothes to attract a woman. Right. It goes towards going out to cl getting club sections. Going out to clubs is for women. We ain't doing it for us. We ain't doing it for other dudes. We're doing it for the women because the status. When you get a section in the club, what do the women do? Oh, I want to come in a section. For when, sure. we get, when we get sections, we point out women to bring it to our section to stroke our ego to make it look good in that section and to you know go, possibly bring one of them home tonight. So everything you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. Right, you know there was a it's so much I want to tell you, but I'm, I'm gonna break it down uh, and, and just make it real concise. One, there's this book I'm gonna turn you on to that speaks specifically to what you just said. It's a small, short book you can read it in a day. Uh -huh. It's called The Community of Self by Dr. Naeem Akbar, and one of the things it talks about in this book, and it's really it's on my mind because I literally was reading through this book yesterday. I read it twice already, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things it talks about is like inside the self, what parts of the self should not be the rulers of the self. And one of the things to talk about is your drives and your instincts, yeah. right? And a person who's always driven by their drive to, you know, to seek pleasure, right? You become this, you just become a pleasure seeker. You're like, you don't want to do anything that's really worthwhile. Right. You're only looking for things that's going to bring the physical body pleasure, yeah. right? I'm gonna turn you on to this book, man. It's a great book. But the other thing you said, man, is, is, is so funny you even brought it up. When I lived in Nashville, me and my homies, like after work, we'd go to a bar, get some drinks, get some food, or have some cigars, and we'd have conversations like this. And one of the things I said, and because there was no women around, and we typically have different conversations when it's just fellas right. than, when, than women are involved, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And one of the conversations we had was like this. I was like, you know, like, you, I was like, you, know you realize that if there was some type of debilitating disease that killed off all women, all females, girls included, all females on the face of the earth, 
just like that. Mm-hmm. I said, do you realize they're probably in, in within two to maybe five years, 90% of guys, I'm talking about heterosexual guys, right, would not give a fuck about what kind of car you drove, how much money you made, you know, kind of clothes you wore, in, to, a, in, in, to a great degree, probably even going to go work out. Now, there would be that 10 to 20% who would still do it because of the survival of the fittest right. type of thing, yeah. right? You know, because you, now you don't only competing with guys for resources right. to stay alive, yeah. right? But so far as attracting women, you wouldn't do it because there are no women to attract. So to your point, like we wouldn't give a shit about that stuff because a lot of the stuff that we do as men is to attract and keep women. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so like it. when you when you get to a point in your life where you like you, you just gotta have like knowledge of self, right? And you, I don't, everybody does things differently. For me, what I do is like being by myself. That helps quiet things. Like when you remove yourself from people in certain situations and places, and you just like, you are literally by yourself alone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes no music, no TV. And you just sit down with your thoughts. You really start to see certain things about yourself that you didn't see before. Sometimes you see how full of shit you are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see how much of an asshole you are. Sometimes you see like, oh, you know what? I got some good parts about me that maybe people can't see, right? Because I don't espouse these enough. You know what I mean? You had touched on the whole celibacy thing, right? When my first daughter's mother and I, we were engaged. When we broke up and she moved out, I put myself through a self-imposed celibacy of one year. When you know about the six degrees of separation, you heard of that? I've heard of it, but I'm not fully aware of it. All right. So it basically just means that, you know, it don't take but like six you know, five or six people for you to get to know somebody, right? Okay. Well, when you are African American and you live in Nashville, your six degrees of separation become like three or four, right? Especially if you only talk about people in the black community, right? So I figured, I was like, man, I ain't, ain't trying to date none of my friends. I don't want to want to date none of my friends' friends because, you know, it, the relationship goes sour, it then it becomes yeah, awkward. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I did was, <laughs> I didn't date anybody. I wasn't fucking with nobody. I wasn't dating nobody. All I was doing was going to work and being dead. And then when I didn't have my daughter, I would go to Cigar Lounge. Uh, you know, I, I, then I go to the the, uh, the wine shop. I give me a, a couple bottles of wine, and I would go home, and and then and work out. That's all I did for a whole year, mm-hmm. and it was amazing the shit that I found out about myself. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then, like even right now, you know. I'm in a space right now where um, I am finding out more about myself. Because then I was 32, 33, Mm -hmm. and now at 48, I'm realizing so many different things about myself just being alone. You know what I mean? So it's, I would actually advise anybody, man, if you wanna wanna take an internal journey, cut off all the damn outside distractions and just be by yourself and think just be but you got to be honest with yourself it's like looking yourself in the mirror and just and sometimes it's, it's talking to yourself people say you you're crazy if you talk to yourself and you I talk, talk back so, like so no much. i talk back to myself all yeah. the time because i need to hear these yeah, things seriously. you know what i mean yeah so me personally somewhere that gets me there to the point where i'm away from the outside and i'm just in a space where i can truly evaluate myself top to bottom good bad and right. really be vulnerable and honest with myself um, I call them journeys. Mm-hmm. I do with shrooms, mushrooms. Oh, I, word. Yeah, I do it once a year. Okay. And I tell, when people say shrooms and whatnot, you know, when they bring up shrooms around me, I'm like, yeah, I do shrooms. Like, oh, yeah. But, nah, I'm not ready to do shrooms with you. I don't do it for recreational purposes. Right. I do it once a year mm-hmm. to where I, um, okay, we're good. That one cut off. I do it once a year to where I take shrooms. I have to be completely, I'm not, a, I'm not around anybody. I have, to, I have to be in nature right. or outside. Right now, what I like to do is I like to ride my bike through downtown with have a playlist a word. on shrooms. But what that does for me, and I like to be in the woods, hiking, camping. I did it watching a campfire. But what it does for me is it opens up doors that need to be open, not doors that I want to be open. When okay. you're drunk, you can, you know, open up this party and have a good time. Me on shrooms, it opened up doors that need to be open, that weren't open on a subconscious or conscious level without it. So when I'm going through these journeys, they open up doors that need to be open, and I realize things like, wow. This was in front of my face subconsciously. It come, subconsciously, it may have been there, but I didn't realize it. And then I really... too much noise. Yeah. And I'm really able to evaluate things and put things out for what it is. Okay. And I only do it once a year because it, it can be powerful, man. But... How long does that experience last when you're on um, Usually about 
five to seven hours. Oh, word that long? Because I do a lot. Okay. At right. one time. Because if, cause if I were to keep doing that, like, my talents will keep getting built. So I do it once a year so that when I do do it, it's like, okay, I'm really, you know, in that space that I need to be in. Got it. Right? My first third eye experience was on shrooms. I was on a cruise boat in the middle of the ocean. Oh, word. Listening to Jimi Hendrix. That's why he's tatted on my okay. leg. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> right? But, I mean, no, just seriously. Like, it really just, like, I really wouldn't be as level as I am now without those journeys once a year. Like, and just be, and so self-aware of myself as well. Seeing, like you said, you can really evaluate how much of an asshole you've been in certain aspects. Right. right? Shit like that. Like, it's not just all good. Like, okay, do this, do this. Okay, this is what you were bad at. Now, this is for me personally, because I know people that say, you know, it doesn't do that for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't smoke weed anymore because it makes me anxious and it a calms word. down other people's anxiety. So everything is different for everybody. For me, personally, that's just something that I found. And that puts me in that space, like how you were saying. That's on that level. Also, just being celibate, not dating. Mm -hmm. It did that for me as well. How you said, you know. That actually is, you know, without any kind of outside interference or... Uh -huh. um, you know, when I say outside interference, I mean like alcohol, yeah, weed or shrooms, social media. Just you know what? Even that because that shit is a drug, bro. It is a drug. You get, you, we all got to take a break from that shit sometimes, man. I would but just be like, that, why have I just spent the last like keeping that sexual power that right. we have right. to ourselves? Yeah, and not it because the thing about having sex is an exchange of energies because like you can't see it, right? But you know, like I don't, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but it's definitely happened to me sometimes. Like you have sex with a chick or whatever, and and she got this, you know, she might be really sexually attracted to you, and you sexually attracted to her, but she just got this, this negative energy about her or whatever. Like in general, right? She's going through a whole lot of shit. She's problematic or whatever, and then for some, some kind of way, that shit ends up bleeding into you, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time. Whatever you're going through, the energy you have bleeds into her. It's an exchange yeah. of energies. And that's why you know we have to be very cognizant about who we decide to exchange those energies with. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That is true. You see this shit, bro? You, do, do you see what I'm talking about? I do. Like, we and, and, there, and, and, and when you first called me, you broke it down like that. Yeah, because it's said, like... <laughs> yeah. This is completely unscripted. I had no idea. Like, you have an idea about what some things you want to talk about. I had no idea. What we gonna talk about? You know, it's just shit. It just it feels really organic I, to me because this is like a, just a regular cigar lounge conversation, just with microphones. And yeah. Recorders. Besides the uh, twenty eight year old question, I don't. I didn't have a script. Like don't I have work. a few things. Yeah. I, so where I'm at now with podcasts, I've been doing it for two or three years. I don't have a script now. Okay. I'll have bullets of certain okay. things I want to bring. Well, that's up. what I mean. Like bullet yeah, points. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. have some bullet points, but that's when I first started. I had a script word for word what I wanted to say because I, you know. But you grow with it. That's why. The godfather of podcasting is Joe Rogan because he okay. has conversations on his. And I always, you know, try to kind of. Uh, he smokes cigars. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. he was. I like Joe Rogan because he does everything on his podcast. He does episodes sober. He'll do episodes on shrooms. He'll do episodes smoking weed. He'll do episodes of drinking. He'll do episodes of all of the above. Right. But it's all it's it. It flows with the the vibe of the show right and that's how i do now right now we're doing an episode smoking a cigar sipping on whiskey i've done episodes where i drank me and someone else drank a whole bottle of hennessy right Word. but it was still smooth i did that with a uh, producer a music producer lex luger i i, I caught pieces of that because uh -huh. i told you i did some research yeah. on you because like i was like let me see what yeah, kind of yeah, people yeah. have on there who will be talking about like yeah. so let me just say this uh -huh. i respect your podcast from the from the different types of people in the different conversations that you have on there, because I'm like, man, this dude didn't talk about relationships. He didn't talk about OnlyFans. He didn't talk about strip clubs. He didn't talk about uh, pimps and pimps versus simp's. And yeah. I was kind of like, this is gonna be interesting. I, yeah. I was looking forward to this because yeah. of all of that. I was like, this this is gonna be dope. And this is added to the list as well. Yeah, no doubt. The aesthetics, the vibe, because it's like the first cigar lounge you've uh, been into what they're to do and you know and, and to do an interview and but also just, just with cigars yeah, in general yeah yeah, yeah 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 and this is i'm i'm definitely <laughs> double back i'm gonna definitely start hitting up a cigar lounge every hand i'm gonna actually bring a date here like just the like you said it makes so much sense so much sense now just the vibe you get from smoke cigars and talking because when you told me on the phone i couldn't grasp it really like, okay. okay i hear you but i i've never been there so i didn't really get it but now 100 okay. percent get it and this is way more smoother than like you said just being at a bar Getting drunk and talking. This is yeah, way because more smooth. See, the thing is, when people go into a... I'm not saying that adults don't get drunk right. in a cigar lounge. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, 
when people go to a cigar bar or lounge, they're not going to get drunk. Right. They're going for a myriad of different reasons. Some people go in there just to kind of wash off the day. Some people go in there to to escape. Yeah. From their from from their daily lives or whatever. Right. Some people go in there for the conversations. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like Taylor Smoke, this is a very co ed uh spot, you know, because they have cigars and they have a bar and stuff like this. And depending on what night you come in here, it'll be a lot, a lot more entertainment. The music will be louder. You know, you could be kind of a party vibe. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. It just kind of depends on what night it is. So, and that kind of would dictate when you would want to come, depending right. on what kind of vibe you're looking for. Right. You know, there are other lounges out there that are mostly guys, mm -hmm. you know. And so when you go in there, you meet guys who are like, uh, medical doctors, PhD guys, IT guys, finance guys, entrepreneurs, blue collar guys, yeah. you know, all sorts of people, right? But the thing that we all have in common is rolled up AIDS tobacco. Yeah. We all love this. Whatever brand we smoking, we just all love this. Whether you know a whole lot about it or you know just a little about it, it doesn't matter. The fact that we love smoking these and we like the environment that it provides, that's what keeps us coming back, man. The um, Charlotte Cigar Week, break that down. What is it? Well, Charlotte Cigar Week is, it is a series of multi-day curated cigar events okay. for people who not just like cigars, but you like people. You know what I mean? With Charlotte Cigar Week, man, it's like, I don't care whether you're on your first cigar or whether you're on your thousand cigar or anywhere in between. Mm -hmm. As long as you like the idea of what cigars can do for your life and, and, and the type of people that it can expose you to both professionally and personally, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you want to learn about cigars and at the same time have a good time doing it. That's what Charlotte Cigar Week is about. It's, it's, it's not about me. You know, it's about people because, you know, I'm, I'm a people person. Man. I'm, yeah. from, I'm from L.A., which is lower Alabama. Okay. You know, I come from an era where, you know, we used to sit on our patio, so we sit on our porch, and we waved everybody who walked by. We, you know, whether we knew you or not, we waved at you, might talk to you. We could leave our screen door, you know, leave our door unlocked in the middle of the day and stuff like that. Shout out you to know. Alabama. My grandfather's from Birmingham. Oh, word? Yeah. I got, I got family who still lives in Birmingham. I used to spend summers in Birmingham when I was a kid. So um, my uncle had uh, a great part to do with the um, – Montgomery boycott. Our word. And uh, E.D. Nixon. Okay. Does that sound familiar to you? The, the name doesn't, but of course, Mo Montgomery boycott. He has a yes. uh, he has an elementary school in Birmingham, actually. But my grandfather was very prideful of that. Very mm -hmm. prideful. Um, and so he should be. In. Is Docena? Does that sound? Familiar? Docena is that a part of Alabama? Docena. I've never heard of Docena. I don't know if it's a part of Alabama. I don't know. I, the, the name Docena. I don't know where it comes from, but. Anyway, I just said to say, shout out to Alabama. Um, they thought I came for them. And that clip we were talking about with Lonnie when she was on North Carolina, because I was saying how, like, just the vast, the difference between North Carolina and Alabama. Mm -hmm. Like, as a northerner, even though technically Maryland is south of the Mason-Dixon line, as a northerner, like, we aren't so quick to maybe go Alabama or Mississippi compared to North Carolina. And that's right. what I broke down. And Alabama people are coming for me like, talk that shit now. I know you saw the fights at the boats and whatnot. I'm like, mm -hmm. I wasn't coming for I love Alabama. That's part of my blood. Okay. I just had to say that. But um, that, that shit was wild, though. <laughs> I still haven't seen it. Yeah. I've seen clips. I've seen oh, parts seen of it. I've seen parts. Oh, I didn't, that, that, I didn't that watch was, the whole thing. That shit was wild. The, the broad. I had folks hit me up. Yeah. There's like uh, this, this cat who does He has a podcast. These two cats out of Texas. And one of them hit me up like, hey, man, you seen your folks? I'm like, yeah. what you talking about? Yeah. They sent me the clip. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like, I'll call you back in a minute. Right. I started watching like, holy shit. They was getting down. <laughs> they was getting down. That, that, the motherfuckers, is, uh, you, you see folks try to like uh, make that shit an unofficial holiday. <laughs> <laughs> that shit is wild. My homegirl from uh, New Orleans, shout out Christine Marie. She texted me and was like, happy, what did she call it? Happy Black People Sticking Together Day or something like that. Yeah, I, man, folks out here making t-shirts about this shit already, oh, yeah. man. Oh, yeah, and, you know how that And hats. Is. And you speaking of that. hats, I like that hat you got. Thank you. But I, 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 like this, I like this shit. This I'm going to get some more made. Would you want one? Just, Would you I like one? Yeah. I got you. I, look, I, got you. I, I rock anybody's what shit. What color? I, I got black, you? royal blue, navy blue, and red. Navy blue. You want navy blue? Navy blue. I got you, man. That's easy. Next time Na we link, navy I, blue. I got you, man. That's my color. Navy That's blue, easy. white, and gold. Navy yeah, blue. My, my favorite color is navy blue as well. I fell in love with it off of the Yankee fitted, even though I'm an Orioles fan. But that's when I really fell in love with it. But navy blue right now, that's all I wear is black and navy blue. Our word. Oh, yeah, I love My favorite colors is navy blue, 
I like earth tone, like with navy blue, okay. black, charcoal gray, brick red, moss green, and brown, and, nice. and, and certain tans. Nice. Yeah, like, I like the, I, that very specific color scheme. Yeah, those yeah, are yeah. things I like. Because it that, that that whole color scheme it makes me feel at ease. Yeah. You know, not cherry red, not candy apple red, right. not, but brick red. Right. It's like it just makes me feel at ease. You're right in the middle. You know what I mean? How do you know when a cigar to no longer smoke it? When it doesn't taste good to you anymore. Gotcha. So there's or, no or when it starts to burn your finger. Okay. So like here's the thing. Like all right, so you see you see where the ashy is, right? And you mm -hmm. see where the cigar stops, right? Yeah. If you see where I'm holding it? Yeah. If you can't hold your cigar uh -huh. right here for this length of time, it's too hot. Which means that you basically need to slow down on it. You're probably puffing on it too often gotcha. or too much. Yeah. So slow down. You should be able to hold your cigar right before right below that burn line. And it should be warm but not hot. Because what you want is like cool smoke. One of the things I always liken to cigars with is food. All right, so imagine have you ever eaten anything that was like it was fresh off the stove or fresh out of the oven, it was super hot and you're like, <laughs> right. like that. Yep. All right. You can't really taste it. Right. Right? Same thing if if you like put something in the refrigerator, you're gonna eat some leftovers, like before you heat it up. If it's cold, it doesn't taste the same. Right. Right. It's a certain temperature that food has to be to be comfortable for your mouth, but also where it releases all the flavors. Yeah. Cigars are the same way. If a cigar is too hot, you're gonna miss out on certain flavors. It's gonna be just a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. If it's too cold, then it means it's not even drawing, so you're not gonna get anything. So it has to be like like cool smoke that you're getting because it's right at a certain temperature mm -hmm. where you can taste everything and the heat is not overwhelming your palate. Man. So right now I think we are both at a point, you know, not at a point, but the, the way we are smoking our cigars, we can actually taste the cigar, which oh, is yeah. good. Definitely. Yeah. Man, we done picked up so many gems on cigars, life, all of the above. Um, before we get out of here, where can, people, where can people find you? Even though I will be dropping your uh, handles and whatnot in the description of this episode, but go ahead and you know, shout it out where they can find well, you or not. Yeah, you can find to? me on Instagram at Charlotte Cigar Week, Facebook at Charlotte Cigar Week. And on my website, charlottecigarweek.com, uh, uh, I would tell anybody out there, I don't want people, because there's, the, there, there's this, this, this image that people who don't smoke cigars, that some people have about cigars. Like, you might smoke something else, but just not cigars. And you have this mental picture that, oh, cigars are bougie, or they're only for people who have a whole lot of money, or, 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 or they're for older people. No, it's not. Like, dude, like I said that the mass majority of people who probably smoke cigars are in their early 30s to, like, mid-50s. But there are people in their 20s who have tried a cigar, right, and they got the right one, and now they love cigars. They might smoke a cigar. They might smoke hookah. They might smoke weed. Right. But they still mix a cigar every now and then into yeah. their rotation, right? Because, like I said before, man, it's you're going to meet different people smoking cigars than you will smoking weed. You're gonna be different people smoking cigars than you will smoking hookah or doing vape or just going to a bar and just drinking. And it is, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try to do certain things to expand our personal and professional network. Definitely. One of my homeboys, uh, he's, a, he's a rep for a cigar company out of Atlanta who covers his area. One thing he told me that uh, a mentor of his told him years ago, he said, learn how to do these things. Learn how to order a steak the right way. Learn how to order a cocktail learn how to play golf, and learn how to smoke a cigar. Why? Because if you can do those four things, you will start to open up your professional network with people, right? Now, I know how to do three or four. I don't play golf, I shoot pool, right? Okay. And anybody who shoots pool, you know, like being in the pool hall is totally different than being on a golf course, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna be different kinds of people, right? Yeah. Well, it's the same thing, you know, you go into a restaurant and you, you order a steak and you don't order a steak well done, yeah. To all my folks, you don't order steak well done. <laughs> you order medium or you're at, at, at the most medium well. That's what but I do. Medium, medium is, well. is, is, is perfect, yeah. right? So order steak medium. Learn how to order a good cocktail or whatnot. Learn how to smoke a cigar. Mm -hmm. And if you pick up golf at some point in time, that's on you. But those three things right there, you'd be amazed at the number of people you would meet once you kind of start perfecting those things. Man, we could go for days, literally. Um <laughs> No, we really could, man. Yeah, this this this, this shit is, is is dope about what the the like. If I didn't smoke cigars, 
like even though you're not a cigar smoker and your podcast has nothing to do with you know cigars or whatever right the fact that i smoke cigars and i do charlotte cigar week that's that's what had me on instagram just going down the rabbit hole and that's how i ran across your podcast yeah or whatever yeah and uh, you know i'll tell you what i appreciate you I having me you, on man, man. Like, seriously no, no seriously, doubt seriously seriously this was i was a little nervous i like you know he probably not even interested in this kind of shit, man because i didn't know how old you were or whatever but i was looking at your guests i'm like you're probably around the same age as his guests or whatever mm -hmm. like he's probably not something he's even interested in so oh, i was man. happy when you said oh for sure let's definitely let's oh, do yeah. that I'm like, oh okay, yeah I, 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 I first and foremost always these episodes i feed off of the energy of my interviewees i always say my episodes only as good as my interviewees i feed off of the energy of you that's all this has been honestly this is more so just being me soaking up game <laughs> i've laid out some shit for you to kind of go and run with and i've just been listening and taking everything in but i just feed off an of energy whoever is on the show and then the aesthetics add to it which you know which is what this was and it's different so i love different stuff bringing different aspects to people i don't want to give people just steak all day every day no doubt let's throw in some you know nice well done rotisserie chicken you know what i mean like, <laughs> well chicken you do need to eat well done yeah 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but steak you need to eat it medium yeah i'm at medium well now so i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna tell you something real quick about about steak so i remember like back in the you have you, you ever heard this company called radio shake all right, so years ago, I Radio when, Shack. When, so years yeah. ago, when Radio Shack was actually a viable company. I was a sales manager. Okay. At radio, at different Radio Shack stores, yeah. and my mentor was my my district manager, uh, this older white dude named Brian Hale. He didn't smoke cigars, but he loved whiskey. Right? And, cool. and and uh, more to the point, good Scotch. We used to have an annual meeting, in uh, an all company meeting in Las Vegas every summer around August. So as a sales manager, this was my first one because I was a new sales manager. So we was at this hotel and the, uh, the waiter came around and asked, do you want chicken or do you want steak? I was like, I ain't want to be black. I ain't want to say chicken. So I was like, give me a steak. They said, how would you like it done? I said, well done. Because up to that point, I was, like, I was always taught, man, make sure that meat is all cooked all the way through, you right. well done. So my, my boss was sitting right next to me, said, don't do that. He's like, order it medium. It's like, man, I want no red meat. Like, Trust me, this will be the best steak you've ever had. Order it medium. Trust me. I was like, all right. I said medium. He was not lying, bro. Yeah. It was the best steak I'd ever had in my life. It was cooked all the way through. It had like a little pink in the middle, but it wasn't tough. It was tender. It was juicy. Oh, and all it had was on it was like a little uh, butter and uh, uh, what's, what's, what's that dog on? Uh, Plant? Yeah, it was some little herb. I, I, yeah, forgot. I don't know why yeah, I can't yeah. think of it right now, but it, it was it, it was sauteed in this nice little butter and herb sauce or whatever yeah. and i was just like jesus this is delicious so from that point on uh -huh. like medium medium do medium. You, do you do the same for your burgers i don't eat burgers okay I, i'm not even a red meat eater a lot like yeah, i probably enjoy steak, steak. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. i probably have a steak twice a year okay i don't eat red meat yeah because i that, just pick this sticks in your body yeah man, it stays i just pick back up on steak but i only eat it once a month right now yeah I, I can't even eat it that much man because uh i don't know what it is. I, I i think I, I realized this when i was going into the navy reserve years ago that uh Shout out to black navy. folks we we lack a certain enzyme that breaks down lactose mm -hmm. and stuff so and this, this is off the subject of steak what i'm saying is just talk about things that I, I had to stop eating for certain reasons milk was one of them you know because i I became lactose intolerant. I even know what it was. I was just like, man, why is my stomach? I got bubble guts every time I eat pizza, or ice cream, or drink milk. So I went from drinking vitamin D milk to 2% low fat milk to lactate to almond milk to now I drink oat milk. Well, because they say everyone, they say everyone says they're lactose intolerant, but that's not what it is. Like you said, to your case, it's just we were not meant to be drinking that in general. Because everyone, like, when they hit, I think it's, what is it, like, 19, 20? I think I was 23. Yeah, somewhere around the there when we hit it where we drink milk, it's like, or we try to do cereal, and it's like, damn, we can't do it. Like, what, what, did my lactose I don't, I don't even eat cereal anymore. I don't either. Cereal yeah. is fucking terrible for you. Like, it's, just, it's, it's a bunch of sugar, sugar man. You That's know what I eat is. for breakfast now? But I don't even eat breakfast. You know, I do this, uh, what's it called, intermittent fasting yeah. thing. So, so what time My first eat? meal is, like, usually around 12. Yeah. And, and now what I do is I get up. And if I'm going to eat something sweet, it'll be then. So I'm, I'll, first thing I'll do is I'm going to have a coffee 
maybe I have might have like a Danish or something. If I don't have that, I'm gonna eat fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, I'll have like a piece of bread or whatever, make some toast or whatever like that. My heaviest meal a day will probably be like my lunch, which is like around three. Yeah. And then yeah, that's a lighter meal is dinner. Be I don't want all that food sitting on my stomach at night. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's I think that's actually a good thing to do, man. I've actually lost 12, 12 pounds. Yeah, you're, just, just, you're not supposed to eat heavy. Just at changing. Night. Yeah. I don't even call it a diet. It's just changing my eating habits. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, uh, Damon, man, I truly appreciate this invitation. You know, you hit me up, uh, getting this, you know, getting the VIP lounge. Uh, Preston is his name. Yeah, Preston Shout Gray is the owner of uh, Taylor Smoke Concord and also Taylor Smoke Uptown. Shout out to Preston. Um, we'll, I would love for us to not even just black on the owned lounge, by the way. Black owned both black of owned them. So make sure if you're on the Charlotte area, get with both of them. We would, um, man, anytime you're in a lounge, let me know. <laughs> we got to run it back man. and just chop it up. I live up. like 12 minutes from you. I used to live down yeah. the street. I, lo I miss it out here. I live um, uptown now. Okay. I used to live down the street from here. I love. I'm, I miss it. And just being right next to Concord Mills or University, it was just everything is right there. Like, there's no stores where I'm at now. Like, you have to go out or if there's a store, it's expensive as hell. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So. But, you know, the, so Taylor Smoke Uptown is in what was called before the epicenter. I, I don't, that's mm -hmm. okay. Queen City Quarter now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's it's what it's in, it's it's in the epicenter. So, like, when I moved here, I. Not when I moved here, but like somewhere around like 2018, 19 or whatever, he actually got a, he, he took an old restaurant and he mm. converted it into an actual lounge nice. right before he got, before he got this one. Nice. And uh, then like right after, you know, when COVID hit, all the businesses started shutting down, man. So there's really only like a handful of businesses yeah. in there that's even open now. Yeah. Oh yeah, that percentage is dead. Um, well, everyone tuning in. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your respective podcast platform, I truly thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Actually, as you like this, subscribe and give me some feedback. Fill out the questionnaire um, on the description as well. It takes two minutes and it's anonymous, so I won't even know who it's sent from. I just ask that you leave honest feedback on the show. Uh, shout out to Damon again, uh, Charlotte Cigar Week, for making this happen. Um, I, real quick, I, yes, can sir. I say this real quick? Yep. Like, I don't know if you saw this right here. Yeah, oh, yeah I saw it. You got to... So, Great with the merch. You're great with the merch. No, but check this out. Mm -hmm. This ain't me. This ain't me. I got a homegirl here. Her name is Stacy Bozeman. She has this. Uh, she has this business called Smoke the Collection. Uh -huh. it's, it's called Wear What You Smoke. So she takes cigar bands and she makes jewelry out of them, wow. like bracelets, little yeah. pendants. Yeah. She, she, man, she, she hooks me up. Like she got me some cufflinks, yeah. necklace braces and stuff so those aren't cigar bands but she put my logo on there where would you smoke? Well, shout out to stacy bozeman with spoke the collection man she's dope she can take anything you have actually and turn it into uh and turn it into you know bracelets or jewelry or whatever go follow her at, uh smoke the collection on instagram this is nice i saw it uh, yeah, from the beginning she's dope man she's dope yep but until next time ladies and gentlemen make sure that y'all stay safe stay sane but most importantly stay blessed until next time peace that's how we do it, man. Hey, this was dope. This, this was this it's was dope. amazing.